Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to the Nikabi Dari series by the pen, the sound of sisters raising their voices with the written word. I'm your host, Samar, and thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of By the Pen. Today we have um, Sister Farah with us, inshallah. So, Sister, could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and also tell us about your book, inshallah? Amazing. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Jazakallah uh, for having me. Wa alaikum assalam and assalamu alaikum to everybody that's listening. Uh, my name is Farah Farah uh, Duali. Um, I live in the UK. I am a first time author. Um, of a book that is looking at fertility and infertility in the Muslim community and beyond. And um, I'm also a qualified coach. And yeah, and we can discuss more about the book as we, you know, talk further today. Inshallah, inshallah. So um, yeah, what actually inspired you to write this book then? Um, brilliant. So the book was inspired by our own struggles. So my husband and I have struggled to conceive for many, many years now. And um, at the start of trying to conceive, um, so we're married 2009, we uh, first started trying to conceive in 2010, and I thought it would be something very straightforward. I thought, you know, you know, you get pregnant straight away. And, um, and I hadn't really, I'm sure it was in my mist, I'm sure, but I, but I had never, I had never witnessed or really seen infertility or people struggling to conceive either on TV or in real life in a way that had actually entered my psyche, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So yes, yes. I'm sure I saw it because there are programs that I watched and I was like, oh yeah, of course it was that. Or there are older relatives of, you know, people in the community, people that you know who you, now I understand what it was, but then I didn't understand. So when it started to happen to us, I was just very confused. Um, I didn't understand what was going on. I also saw that there was very little support. So I, I, tried to find books I tried to find um podcasts weren't really a thing then I guess but I tried to find um you know like online support anything like that and there was not much tailored um that was specific for the Muslim community it was there was some support and then there was other elements of it that were just not suitable for um a Muslim woman a Mm -hmm. Muslim couple and so for me from that day I thought you know what whatever happens in my own journey um this is something that is needed I don't want anyone else to be feeling this isolated and this confused and this forgotten about in a way and not to find some basic information just because none of us have bothered to share that to share our own story or to share that information so that's where the idea was born and then um all these years later I I um I did it (laughs) alhamdulillah mashallah so can I ask you did you manage to conceive eventually no 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 so we've been married for over we're married 13 and a half years now we've been trying to conceive for 12 and a half years and we we don't have any biological children subhanallah so have you been through the process of of, i'm assuming you've obviously been through the process of trying to find out why yeah 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 yeah. so um so we we are so a lot of this i really really urge um any of the listeners in any english-speaking country to um you know, try and get the book to purchase the book because a lot of our own story, mm-hmm. a lot of the struggles and a lot of details around uh, d- different treatments and stuff like that is in the book. And um, but yeah, for us, we, we you know, we went, we followed the steps of having tests and finding out what's going on. We've had uh, four rounds of um, IVF that have all failed. And um, we were for many, 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 many years in the unexplained category. So there will be a lot of couples out there who are unable to conceive, but on paper, they should be able to conceive. No, no, I said, so all the, all your tests come back normal, his come back normal, yours come back normal. The doctor's telling you, so I discussed in the book how we, one, we were very young, you know, we were very early 20s. And yes. also uh, on paper, we were very, very fertile. So, and when we were going through the steps of having tests and being asked to be referred to IVF and things like that was always very much like okay Farah no problem we'll do this for you but don't worry because you will conceive you know you're more likely to conceive before even before we even get to that stage or before this happens or it was always like a guarantee the way it Mm -hmm. happened to us it was like oh you're you're so fertile like don't worry um and then it doesn't happen It, it doesn't happen and the opposite happens and and then you're just put into this unexplained category where they're like well we we don't know why you're not getting pregnant which actually can make it much worse because for those who have specific and isolated fertility issues whether it's male or female then at least you can target that 
you can then start to looking at treating that issue or that yes of course problem. of course but yeah but when they're saying there's nothing you just have to try everything mm -hmm. not knowing where to target and um, I will say though that almost 13 years later in our um, okay so it's not necessarily what tests have shown but now because of the way our treatments and stuff like that have gone they think it's an egg issue so all these years later they're saying it's probably an egg issue there's something to do with the eggs not maturing and if eggs don't mature then they can't be fertilized um, and so they're thinking it's something to do with the eggs, but we're still technically in the subcategory of unexplained, mm. which is very frustrating, but, you know. It just goes to show that, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you to have a child, you will have a child, and it's, it's, it's all up to Allah's decree, literally, because absolutely, you know, absolutely. these are the things that, like, as Muslims, you know, we have to, like, obviously, it's, it can, obviously it's going to be distressing, but it's like, you get tested okay. through the thing that you really want and the things that you love. So, subhanAllah. I want to yeah, ask really you, a, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. You're probably going to be, I don't be annoyed with me, sister, right? But <laughs> and you've probably had a lot of people ask you these questions, but I'm a hijama therapist. So I always have to ask people, have you tried hijama? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, and um, you and you've done all the, you've gone through the whole holistic process and the womb massage and all these different things. Yeah. Um, so again, that's all in the book in the sense that for for forget even regardless of my story, because we, 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 we shared the book and we're, we're sharing, we're starting the conversation of this topic for the other sisters, for other couples, for all yes, of us yes. going through this. And so I do want everyone to know that there there is many options for you. So there's the holistic route. There's the, you know, the generic medical route There is doing nothing. And just kind of hoping for the best and, mm -hmm. you, you know, and just making dua. And I'm not saying making dua is nothing, but you also need to take action as well. Yes. And, and then there's a combination. And for me, I really recommend combination personally. Um, I'm not against um, medical treatments, if that's for you, because for some people that is the only way it's going to work and you need that support and it's available to you and it's halal and it's beneficial. So go for it. And then there are other people where maybe the um, holistic route is sufficient um, for us, we've done. I've done a combination of everything. Um, mm -hmm. I in the book I discuss um, not necessarily my story, but the the, the way the book is laid out. So uh, let me share the title of the book with you. It's called Taking Control: A Muslim Woman's Guide to Surviving Infertility. And the the reason we'll discuss later why it's called Taking Control. But one of the things that the book does is lay out different stages of struggling to conceive. So what the book does is it's split into three sections. So the first section is around how to cope with, um, you know, with it, within your marriage, within your identity as a woman, with, um, with you know, cultural and social pressures, with all those kind of things, right? The mental health side of it, mm -hmm. it deals with all of that. Um, the second chapter of the book deals with all of the treatment options that are suitable for Muslim couples and all of the treatment options are available, some which will be recommended to you, but that are not suitable for you. Right. As a Muslim, right? They're not permissible. And so within that, we talk about hijama thoroughly. We talk about um, yoga thoroughly. We talk about uh, um, acupuncture uh, thoroughly, um, and and also just like as in as in, like diet and exercise and all those kind of things, because we know that that can uh, can for some people have an impact. Have an impact. Um, so yeah, all those things are discussed thoroughly, and I and I do. I do think it's something that people should consider and look at if they're struggling to conceive. Yeah, subhanAllah. It's, it's, it's like, it's strange because, I mean, like, I, I, I don't know, like, um, it, um, there's this thing called the womb healing. I'm sure you probably must have uh, heard about that. But then th th these, um, you know, people who work as doulas and stuff, what do, I, what do you call, you know what a doula is right I'm sure you know what yeah, a doula. Of course. please explain it because there will be many people who have never heard of it yeah so well that's that's what I'm trying to think how can I explain what's a doula okay well, a doula is basically they're kind of like a midwife but not like completely like so it's more like our midwife right? yeah holistic so, yeah, yeah so like birthing kind of supports person so you can have a usually in the UK like in western country you you have your doula alongside your midwife so yes. they're not like, um, you know, they're not used that they're not like an official midwife. But I think in like exactly. maybe African and Asian countries, that's more what a traditional midwife would be. You know, the, the local mm -hmm. auntie from the area who helps everybody give birth. That's basically what she is, because I know that um, a lot of the doulas in the West, they have been educated through, from, you know, doulas from 
African countries that like some I, I, some of the ones that I was following personally, they have been to villages in West Africa, for example, and have studied under these, uh, you know, local traditional midwives. That's where they get a lot of their, you know, information and learning from. So anyways, um, one of the things said if I was to ever give birth, I'd, I'd want to do that because absolutely you know, I like the idea of natural birth. I like the idea of having a doula, I love the idea of water birth. These are all plants that you make, but yes, Allah is the best of plants, you know? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So one of, the, one of the things that they do actually, and which I found interesting was the womb massage. Because I remember mm. like one of the things that I saw, they were saying that sometimes one of the reasons why a woman, um, you know, doesn't conceive is because her womb is actually tilted, mm-hmm. which I thought like, how does that happen? You know, right? Mizan therapy? Is it called mizan therapy? Now? Yes, the mizan therapy. Yeah, yeah. Mizan therapy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And I just Amazing. thought like, how can your womb be tilted? I mean, how does that happen? You know, so that's something right. for people to um, think about as well. Because um, I don't, I don't these days, I don't really hear people talk about it too much. But I think that's something for um, you know, if and if there's any listeners, maybe if they haven't heard of that, that's something they could try. Because in your case, obviously, you said you obviously you've tried literally everything, but. Yeah, when you don't know about certain you know, other things, but obviously for listeners that are in a similar situation, if they haven't tried that, I that might be something. It. I think uh, the only thing I would say is please proceed with caution for a lot of the holistic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only thing that I discuss deeply in my book is that those things are, we know they work. And actually a lot of those holistic things that are seen as something slightly odd now, especially in the West, are actually have been around for way longer. Of course, of course they have. Treat, right? IVF is less than like 80 years old or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like it's very young, right? Whereas something like acupuncture or hichama has been around for so, for thousands of years. So I, I really do recommend people to be a bit more open-minded and to kind of look at those, because you will have family members as well, by the way, who will say to you, don't do that. Just go straight to the doctor. Just trust the doctor. Um, and then you have people from the holistic community who look at you sideways if you decide to have IVF. So people will judge, you know, your your options either way, I feel like sometimes. But you need to kind of know what's right for you, what is what is maybe appropriate for your situation, what, um, you know, what you can financially afford. But at the same time, with holistic thing, with holistic treatments, the sad reality is that it's not as regulated I say mm-hmm. Western medicine in the UK, they've got the NHS, which is very regulated, very systematic. Um, but for example, something like a Hichama clinic, a Nizan therapy clinic, acupuncture, Rukia, this is the pl- even even things like people giving you different vitamins and things like that, um, or, or or different things that they say you're deficient in. Yes, there's truth to that. Yes, and please research it. But Ah, I think we also know that there's a lot of people that want to make money out of your desperation, yes, out of your of ignorance. It's very, very hard to test if this mizan therapy is helping you or the hijab is helping you. So, it's, so I would just say proceed with caution. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, if you're a Muslim, do your obviously do your sahara every stage. Mm-hmm. You know, do do really don't just. I want them to trust the process, but I want them to be open and 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 take control of the situation and know that there are people here to feed out of your desperation and that's where they will quote crazy amounts of money and so many amazing you know so many sessions and stuff like that so i just say do it but proceed with caution at every stage and same with with all types of treatments i guess and nothing's guaranteed at the end of the day yeah and i I, and i think i don't know for me personally i would probably I don't know, like, I, I, I like the natural route as, as like, I'm, that's, that's the kind of person I'm, I like to always take the natural mm-hmm. route first, so I would probably, yeah. if, if after having the tests, um, if after having, like, all these different tests and things like that and everything says normal, I would probably go down the natural route first, because I think it's yeah. probably going to be the cheaper option, at least, to start with, yeah. and then if you don't yeah. have success with them, then I would try, because IVF must cost a bucket load, and as a hijama yeah. therapist myself, I've had clients, alhamdulillah, who after many years of not conceiving have conceived after even just one appointment. So, I mean, I remember my first um, success story with hijama and fertility. My client, she hadn't conceived for eight years of marriage and she came and had hijama for the first time. And then she went to Turkey to do IVF treatment. And when she went there, they said, oh, we can't help you. And she looked at them. She's like, well, why? And then they told her that she was already pregnant. So alhamdulillah, like that was, you know, that was within, I think, a month or two that she that she'd had the hijama. So alhamdulillah, it was, and then since that time, she's managed to, you know, conceive again, like, you know. So alhamdulillah, 
and and I've had other clients as well after that too but that's that no, no, was my first lot, story which which really handled their worked out so just to save if you could save money that's what I would say like you know because as I said IVF cost a lot and I've got a friend at the moment who you know is, um, is do you know do you know what it is as well I really just think it depends on what the test show I think it mm-hmm. does of course on, I think I think everybody has to decide for themselves right yes um, so for example for us I we took four and a half years break of doing nothing and I mean nothing like we're mm-hmm. not doing IVF we're not doing holistic we're not doing nothing we're not thinking about this we're living our lives now I know that the majority of people don't want you like would not advise that right because they they were like oh my god especially for females it's like oh my god you're getting older why are you delaying it why are you not doing anything for four and a half years so for me I just feel like it doesn't matter what decision you make as long as you understand what, of course, of you understand course. what your body needs and you understand what your marriage needs and you know and and so for me what I would say is I'm totally with you and I really do support and understand. And and by the way, I really think we should be using holistic treatment like HRMA regardless. Like, I don't even care if there's nothing wrong with you. Like, yes, of I course, I, yes. I, 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 it's part of Sunnah and I just mm-hmm. feel like you don't have to, to have a backache you don't, or back pain. You don't have to wait for infertility. Like, these are things that is our body's designed to benefit from these treatments, subhanAllah. So I really do think they're a blessing and I do think we should tap into them as much as possible, as long as we have reputable people doing it. Of course. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's good to make sure you get, you know, go to a therapist who is, you know, comes well recommended, you know, and like, you know, because this is one of the things, like you said, sometimes people are just trying to get money from others like recently one of my clients um because i was you know since leaving the uk obviously i've abandoned stuff like i abandoned my clients yeah, there, so. i was gonna say where, where, whereabouts in the uk are you from because your accent i feel I'm like from you're london. From... i'm from london i could tell i, I could tell yeah, yeah, yeah for many years like nearly yes. 20 years so subhanallah like a lot of my clients that well what one of them recently she called me and she was quite distressed actually because she said that she went to another lady to do hijama and mm. the woman basically told her that she feels that, that, that you know, my client has um, like some kind of possession or sihar or something oh, like yeah, that. Course, and was trying to convince idea. the girl that there's something wrong with her when she hasn't had any symptoms. And I said to her, uh, she's, uh, she's asking me if I think she's got something. And I said, well, it's been um, a year, more than a year since I've treated you. So obviously anything could happen in that time. But I said to her, I also have you personally had any symptoms which would indicate that there's something wrong with you? Do you feel that there's any, you know, strange things happening in your life or any weird changes? You're not, you're not, you don't feel your regular self. She hadn't, she didn't feel anything at all. But this woman is trying to convince her, saying of that. Course. Some, oh, no, no. So of you course. do get complete charlatans out there. So you really need to Completely. be careful you know and go with somebody that is you know highly recommended so it's at some from somebody who's actually had hijama from the person not somebody who just says oh well this person is you know mashallah pious or something like that because you know that's no, another no, problem no. in yeah, the community do you know yeah, 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 yeah. people kind of try to idolize somebody that they just respect for for you know whatever reason and you know they might be good with I don't know praying five times a day doesn't yes, mean Allah, that they do that yes. to pajama, do you know what I mean and you know yeah like, I'm you with know, you know what I mean I'm with you I'm with I like, you I'm with you please I, go I to I a like clean environment you, yeah I, I like what you said about um you know that you did nothing for four and a half years because I remember like um I've had you know some friends in similar situation and even some clients and I just say to them try not to stress about it because stress can be a factor that you know you get so burdened down and because the Muslim community <laughs> it's like you get married and everybody wants to know when you're pregnant straight well, so away. No, absolutely you know what I mean and um so I think it's good that you took that decision you know as you and your husband to you know just focus on yourselves and just enjoy your life a bit because it can be something that you know people get so bogged down in it becomes a stressful thing I remember um there's a friend of mine and she said her and her husband they decided they didn't want to have children for the first six years so and I said how did you even cope because people must have been going crazy around you for, trying to force you to be pregnant you know absolutely and, absolutely and she just said well you know it's our marriage it's our business that's it that's it that's, that's it, it. That's and, it. and it literally that's... that is okay and absolutely fine it's and people need to stop feeling pressured from others with what's happening in their lives and you know another absolutely. thing as well that I would just like to say in this point and I know this is your interview but I really feel passionately no, about silly. this you know because yeah you know I, I see that sisters go through these things all the time and brothers obviously it's a heavy but topic yeah you know the main thing when we make dua for children we should always ask Allah for a righteous child and I know a sister subhanallah she said that she always says to Allah that you know she only wants 
pious children. If it's not going to be a righteous child, if it's not going to be some someone from paradise, she doesn't want it. Subhana, the sisters had like eight miscarriages, but I think she has about six children. So, you know, when we look at that, you know, we could, you know, you can conceive, but you can have a miscarriage, you know, there's people that go through these things and it's like, there's, there's so many things in life that can, wisdom we in can experience and yeah, and like they can be traumatic. So even you not conceiving, maybe as well, that is a blessing in and of itself, because maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to have to go through the trauma of having a miscarriage as well, you know, but I mean, and, no, 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 that, that's. No, but that's the thing and this is the beauty of not just identifying as a muslim but living as a muslim yes. because it is there's no even maybe about it like it is so if 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 god gives us biological children we know that that's khair for us right like you you've got your answer kind of thing like that's the best thing that would have ha- that could have happened for you but say for example until now so from from getting married to now there is no maybe like not yeah. having children is by far the best thing that could have happened to us. Like it's go because he, if that's what if that's what he's designed, then you know he's designed the best for you. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. So th- 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 yeah, there's no even um doubting it. There's no oh, but it would have been no, no. You, he's got this. Like <laughs> like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala like has got this. He doesn't need our input in trying to understand like what's best for us. We can make dua for our desires. And for example. Uh, procreating and wanting children is something that is naturally designed in us so that the human race continues right so we know it's something that for the majority of us it's it's a naturally it's a natural thing in us it's it's a basic human need to want to have children right absolutely so of course we want that desire of course you make that dua. of course you have hard days right we're not robots you feel it all you you know all of those kind of things but but this is where we then have to question our own um at iman this is where we have to really try and understand what our relationship with god is and this is what we need to know what islam means to us right because if i'm a exactly. muslim because i was born into a muslim home then yeah this is going to be devastating i won't be able to handle this if that makes sense but if mm-hmm. i'm a muslim because i'm understanding the submission part of what islam says then that's it he's got you it's like okay allah take me where you need to take me because like like i'm in love with your plan not exactly mine, if that makes sense mm-hmm. so I, I i think and i think all that we understand it until it comes to marriage until it comes to children and then all of a sudden a lot of us i men can suffer uh, you know it becomes so much more hard to kind of understand it and i just that's really one of the key messages of this book really is uh, uh, and, and I know you might be we might discuss that further but really it's this thing of like try and understand why you're here like try and understand yes. what is being designed for you um, so yeah it, it's a lot but at the same time you need to be able to understand what is right for you at what stage in your life like you said before so if starting holistic treatment is great if, if start going straight because I know um, if I could just tell you a quick story I know somebody in my family who got, was married uh, got married two and a half years ago I think mm-hmm. And when she got married, she was 35, 35, mm-hmm. 35. And then they found, uh, yeah, they weren't conceiving. There was some blocked tubes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so for her, her thing was, I don't care about trying to unblock the tube, which would have been, for me, seems like, as an outsider, it seems like the most straightforward thing, th- thing to do. Um, instead of doing that, instead of doing anything holistic, instead of doing anything spiritual, it was straight away. It was like IVF after IVF after IVF. Mm. Um, and for her, the reason for her was age. So for her, she's saying, I don't have time to dilly dally with all of this stuff. If yes, that makes yes, sense. Like yes. I need something that might give me a higher chance of result mm-hmm. a lot quicker in a way that I can understand it. If I was 25, I'd maybe go down this route. And for me, I, it made sense to me. Like, I don't have to agree with it. Yes, but I understand absolutely. why she's got to that logic, right? So it, that's why I always say it has to do with you. You ha- So for example, so for example, if it becomes... Um, if it's something to do with um, sperm mobility or something mm-hmm. right or not enough sperm or or they're not even um sometimes there's males that release they do release sperm but it's so minute that it's not enough to conceive for example mm-hmm. so things like that yes HRM would help yes all those things would help but maybe a simple IVF treatment would actually be very simple for that because then you could just have ICSI they get the bit of sperm that's working and they inject it into you and voila you're pregnant inshallah right so it really depends on the situation and what you what what you need in that moment so after the tests that's the only time then you can decide 
what's the best course of action at that stage absolutely I think that that makes a lot of sense. I've said a lot there. (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I'm just glad that you've written this kind of book to Bennis because, you know, there's a lot of sisters and brothers, you know, who will benefit from this. And I think it's important that our community, you know, talks about these kind of things and has more acceptance to and and more compassion and empathy, actually, for couples who are going through this because there's so much pressure in the Muslim community. When you do get married, it's just like, oh, well, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids? And I had a friend that, you know, she was married for a while, for some few years, and she hadn't conceived. And people, you know, she eventually, because people kept asking her so much, she just started telling people she didn't want to have children because that just shut them up, basically. Oh. Like, you know, there was, you know, when they heard that, that was just like, you know, they didn't know what to say after that. You know, she did <laughs> want to have children, but that was her way of just not having that conversation because she was so sick. Of being asked why she's why she's not pregnant why hasn't she got any yeah, kids so kind of like you know and i there think that... whole, there, there is a whole chapter sorry to interrupt you sis there is a whole chapter in the book dedicated to the message is a message for friends and family yes and yes it's good, all the silly good. do's and don'ts as don't do this, do, you know all that kind of Marshall, stuff like you've covered all the bases <laughs> we're really trying to cover all the bases <laughs> hello my body hello my body <laughs> that's fantastic so <laughs> Basically, there's something in this book for everybody. So, um, right, so we know definitely what your inspiration was for writing the book, Alhamdulillah, and your motivation. Um, what would you say was your biggest challenge um, when writing this book? I think it was the two things, I would say. The biggest challenge um, was being okay with how vulnerable it was for people that I know in particular, to read the book. So once it was actually out, rather than when I was reading it, rather rather than when I was writing it, when it actually was released back in June of this year, and, you know, you have friends and family actually reading it, and then they're messaging you that, oh, my God, I didn't know this, or I'm reading this. That, for me, was very, like, exposing, because I have put a lot of my heart into this. And I and by reading this book, you understand the mindset and the pain and the needs and the wants of not just myself, but also so many of us that are in these shoes. Because the beauty of this book is that a lot of sisters um, have written to me and said, <laughs> the funniest line I get often is, did you interview me for this book? Like, it's, like, so like I'm reading the pages and you're writing my story that I don't even know when I told you my story. Like, I don't understand how you know this. And it's like, because we're different, but we're the same. Yes. Like, the pains and the fears and the comments are all the same at the end of the day. So by reading this book, what happened then is that I exposed not myself, but also all the sisters that are going through this um, and all the fears that we have and all the things that we need. And and so anyway, for me, that was very, very, um, that was challenging, I think, to be okay. And I had, I think I had to really just, alhamdulillah, the week of the, the book was coming out, the week that it was releasing, I was actually in Mecca. I was in, uh, doing Umrah, alhamdulillah, which was a beautiful distraction because not only was I able to... Um, just focus on my ibadah, you know, make dua, the house of Allah, that, that, I, that I have that sakina that I needed at that moment. But also I'm just busy because you're traveling and da, 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 da. So it was a blessing because that for me was very challenging. Second to that, during the writing process, I would just say all the emotional stuff because I wrote mm-hmm. the first draft of the book in six weeks. SubhanAllah. So the whole wow. thing back to front, six weeks. And you can imagine, because it was during lockdown, so I had nothing else to do, by the way. Um, so that's that's the only reason I was able to do it if I was working or there was children around or anything I would not have been able to do it but because it was locked down I wasn't doing anything it, it allowed me just to focus on it every single day um, but what then happened is that it's very intense so all of the emotion from all of the different aspects mm. come into play at a, at a, at a really accelerated um, speed, speed so I remember emotionally it was just very like like I had to do a lot of journaling, a lot of praying, a lot of talking mm-hmm. during that time. And I was having counseling at the same time as well. So there was a there was um, a lot of emotional stuff coming up. And that was, it was actually beautiful in a weird way. It was very therapeutic. It was nice. I was crying a lot as I was typing. Um, but actually it was, I think my body needed it maybe. Because it felt a release at the same time. Yes. Yes, that. that really, alhamdulillah. So yeah, did you think yeah. that you would ever become an author? Um, 
is, is book really? writing something you have are you are you used no. to writing basically like before no, you no, said you no, finished no, writing your book the first draft within six weeks that's like super quick so <laughs> no 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 um so I, I had no desire to be an author like ever I mean when you're young I guess I don't know did you want to be an author when you were young I think everybody wants to be an author when they're young because I don't know when I was young I wanted to be a teacher and author because that's all I knew if that makes sense like I read mm-hmm. books and I went to school <laughs> so like they were the only two things that I knew but as an adult you know, it was nothing I aspired to ever and um, I'm not necessarily I'm a speaker more than a writer um so I don't in- necessarily enjoy writing and mm-hmm. like beautifying words and message and and I and I actually I'll be really honest I don't think I'm necessarily a really strong writer as well but what happened here is that I felt like I had a message yes. so yeah so that's when you asked the book when you asked that question I said because mm, I thought well yeah for like 10 12 years I knew I wanted to write this book I don't know about necessarily wanting to be an author and so that's why, and, and, and even one of my biggest fears about around this book was, who am I to write this book, right? And I guess that's a fear that many of us will have about goals, goals um, in our lives. Um, and, and, and I had to just tell myself, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to, well, actually, I had help. Um, I, we can talk about who I had help from um, in a minute, but I had help and I was in a coaching program and stuff like that. And they kept, one of the things I kept saying every week was, I don't think it's going to be any good because I can't write like you lot. I, I don't write all these flowery words. Like I mm-hmm. enjoy reading that, but I can't do it. And if I try, it's, it's so muddled. Um, and that's what they kept saying. They were like, no, just write how you write. Like speak, like write how you speak. Exactly. Just say the message as you would tell us. Mm-hmm. And I swear that was the best thing I could have ever been told because I did it. I, I just, I had to fight with myself because every time I would read you, I'd be like, oh, this is so ugly. Like, this is not that beautiful flowery thing that people write. But I just kept telling myself, it doesn't matter. Just write the message, write the message. And that's amazing because that's one of the biggest compliments I have now about the book is by reading the book, I feel like I'm talking to you. And people that know me are like, I can hear your voice. Like, this is just... This is you just talking, if that makes sense. So uh, that's how I got through it. But no, I, I didn't necessarily have any big aspirations to be an author, but I had a burning message I felt that I had to share. Alhamdulillah. And who would you say has been um, your biggest supporters writing this book? Yes. Yeah, so it was actually uh, uh, one, partic- one person in particular, but really it's a collective. So what I did, and actually I would recommend this for any budding authors, anybody that feels like they have a message but don't know where to start. Um, it doesn't have to be just her, but what I did is I joined a program by uh, Sister Naima B. Roberts. Yes. Um, yes. Alhamdulillah. Has, uh, write, Alhamdulillah. She has many writing courses and things like that. And she has one called um, the Release Program. Mm-hmm. And the whole point of that program is to get your draft done. So your first draft of the manuscript done in 12 weeks. And so you're in a coaching program where you meet every week and um, you have templates. You have like a guide of how you would structure a book. You get all the basics for someone like me who had no clue where to start. That was one of the most uh, structuring things for me. Like I needed that structure. I needed to be, you know, logging in every week on Zoom and they ask you, how many words have you written this week? Oh, I did this. Da, 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 for us to share where, where we're stuck and to have other sisters advising as well. Um, so that having been part of a program by people who know what they're doing, people have written books before that was incredible that's number one number two was uh one friend in particular so she's not she's a mother of four beautiful for uh, be- she has four beautiful children mashallah Mubarak. she's never suffered with infertility or anything like that but uh, she was a huge support in this and she was one of the first people to read the book and to critique the book and you know just and just be there as well just to listen to you through the fears and the worries and the and the goals and all those kind of things and then the third person that helped massively, especially when it came to publishing traditionally, because the book was picked up and uh, published traditionally, um, it was a sister called Hind Hagasi, Hind Hagasi, H-E-N-D. Mm-hmm. Um, she is an American Egyptian. I, I think she's moved back to Egyptian now. She's an incredible, incredible sister. I've never met her in real life, but she's one of those sisters you make dua for for life because she's an editor and she's part of the program that Sister Naima B. Roberts does, mm-hmm. Hind Hagasi, because yes. she goes above and beyond She's the person that, like, um, she you know I had a number and I would just WhatsApp her. Oh, what would what would I do about this? Is this tradi- you know is this normal in this industry? What what this publisher said this? What does that mean? Like, and and she wasn't paid for that. She was doing all of that because she just cares. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say it, in a nutshell, it was um those three, and then obviously friends, family, husband, all those kind of you know it's a whole. Pe- everybody in your support system helps you in some way, right? But in terms of 
um, practically, like in, in terms of writing practically, it was the program. It was that sister Hintagasi, and it was my friend who was the first person to kind of edit and look at the book. What kind of advice would you give to someone who is thinking of writing a book? I would say the first question is ask yourself why you want to write the book. What's the purpose? What is it? Because just because you enjoy it and you want to add something? Is it because you have a burning message? Is it because you see a lot of other people doing it now you want to do it? You've really got to understand, you know, that famous thing of like, why? Just understand your why? Because I really do advise against any of us, right? Young people, adults, women, anybody. I do advise people doing things because everybody else is doing it. Because sometimes that can it can feel like we can feel the pressure to do things. So one, understand why you're doing it. That's number one. Number two, get a support system. So it can be a, a something formal, like a coaching group. It can be a group of, you know, I don't know, people, your friends. It can be whatever, but just have a support system that understands what you're doing, that believes in what you're doing, that can support you. And thirdly, I would say um, don't try to be perfect. Like you will figure things out as you go along. Don't feel like you have to have the answers don't feel like you have to go on all these writing courses no once you have the first two things in place the rest of it will kind of figure itself out and just know that the degree one to air but also destiny are very powerful things so things will pan out the way they're supposed to pan out so just do your bit do what you're capable of in that time in your life and and let the rest do its thing okay inshallah mashallah so where can we find your book brilliant so the book um it depends so in theory it's everywhere where books are sold so for example in the uk it would be available in like waterstones uh, wh smith amazon any of those places um but it does depend on where you are in the world so again it should be around you know majority of the countries in the world english-speaking countries so if wherever you are in the world if you if you have amazon for example maybe check if it's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Other than that, Google where that, so the book, the, the title is Taking Control, A Muslim Woman's Guide to Surviving Infertility, or you can just put Taking Control and then my name, and and then if it's sold in your country, it should come up. Um, but in theory, for most people, I think Amazon is probably the most easiest. Okay. And inshallah, we'll put the, the Amazon link in the description box and um, any other links that you might have for other, other websites, if there are, inshallah. And um, have you got a website? Um, not really, not really. I do have, so for example, now I have a, um, I have, I have, what's it called? I have, so even the, the, the book, the landing page for the book, for example, now if somebody wanted to buy it, they can go onto my Instagram, they can um, follow the the link that will take you to all those places that I just mentioned, right? So that's all under faradwali.com, but I've not yet built the website. Okay. I don't know if I will or I won't. Yeah, well, you don't really need one. Exactly. <laughs> you don't really need the website. I mean, I was just asking it, just in case you did have one, but yeah, you don't really need yeah, it. So, so we have the domain. We might open it up, but for now, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah alhamdulillah. I think I think websites are kind of going out of fashion a bit anyway, Sabrina. So I, I don't I, I'm not advising anybody to get a website if you don't need it. I know exactly what you mean. Um can I say one thing to all of the listeners, inshallah? Of course. I'm, I'm terrible at this and I need to get better. Is um if you've read the book, please leave a review wherever you purchased it. And if you don't have the book, then obviously, like we said, we're going to add the link. So order it from Amazon. And once you've read it, inshallah, please leave a review because I get, wallahi, I get so many messages, subhanAllah, right? So on Instagram, it could be people that I don't know, many people that I know, and, and you know, all types of people, right? And they will tell me quotes from the book. They will tell me how incredible this book is, how it's, you know, whatever, right? All these positive things. But we're not translating that to reviews online, which really do make a difference in the end. Of course. They make a difference in, you know, in, in seeing the book and all those kind of things. So please, if I could just urge anyone and everyone who has read it or will read it, if you could re if you could leave a review on somewhere like Amazon, but also a place like Goodreads and things like that, it makes a huge difference. Absolutely. That's, and that's, 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 that's for all of the books, to be honest, all of the books that, um, especially by Muslim authors that we read, we need, really need to try to give them our support so that they can be, you know, you know, just encouraged in what they're doing, to be honest. Exactly. And, and, and what happens is that we let people know these books exist because 
if if you're not Oprah or Will Smith and everybody knows your book is out, pe- pe- we people just don't know it's there. If that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. If you was writing a book on Hachama, I want to read that book. But yes. If I don't know it exists. I can't buy it, and therefore I can't get that support. So we, we really really need to let create awareness around each other's books and things. Definitely, like that. definitely. I'm really like one of the reasons why I started the podcast. <laughs> I'm really yeah. I love it oh, because yeah it's, it's important space, it's, it's important way. to know that that especially Muslim women are doing these kind of things writing books you know so um you know it's something it's a legacy that you're leaving for you know to for future generations you know till off, after you die and everything you know so it's really it's really important we need yeah, that accept it from all of us we do need it we definitely I mean, need it I mean our fecum sister it's been a pleasure talking to you today and listening to your experiences and fertility journey and um may Allah bless you with many righteous and pious children I mean and you know whatever yeah. the case may be whatever Allah has decreed for us I pray Allah that it will be the best in this dunya wal akhirah I mean I mean, I mean, and 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 thank you to you. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the book and and infertility, which and fertility, which is a very important topic for all of us, whether we have children or not. And this kind of space that you're creating, this safe space where sisters can just come on, they don't have to show their face necessarily, but we can still share um, such powerful stories is incredible and it's needed. So may Allah bless you in what you're doing as well. Amen. Amen. Wa ayaki sister. Barakallahu feekum. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum.